Hi everyone, my name is Maya and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Brook Violin and its place in historical performance practice. So to start off, I'm going to talk about how um, the Brook Violin is built and how it's different from the modern violin. So um, first off, it's probably pretty noticeable that we don't use a chin rest or a shoulder rest with Brook Violin. Instead, we balance it on our collarbone and our shoulder and that way there's a lot of room for freedom and um, the ability to really connect with the instrument. And when you learn birth island, your teacher spends a lot of time making sure you know exactly where to place it and have it uh, comfortably balanced. Another thing is the birth violin uses gut strings. So instead of the modern violin, I don't know if you can see on this video, but the modern violin always has overwound with metal strings versus the Brook violin is, is made out of plain gut. So it's just made out of animal gut without the metal overwinding. Another difference is that the Brook violin has a shorter fingerboard than the, than the modern violin. And this works out because the, the Brook violin doesn't use a lot of shifting. It's not common in the music for that time. Something else is the difference in bows between the modern bow and the, the Brook bow. So you might be able to see um, that the modern bow is a lot bigger. So the, the Brook violin bow is shorter and also a lot lighter. Um, the, frog, the modern violin frog is much bigger and heavier, which works well for the you know, attack strokes and sorts that we do. But the, the Brook violin bow, you really have to think about using bow speed and weight to coax out the string, the, the sound from the gut strings, because gut strings have a lot more friction than modern strings. And so if we don't listen to what the string needs and how much weight and speed exactly it calls for, then it doesn't work out too well. So if I really think about connecting with the string and using my body with the violin, um, you know, you get a pretty good sound. But if if I only if I only think about pressing or um, play perpendicular, which is vertical weight, it doesn't work very well. So like, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't work. So Brook Island really teaches you to to better your right right hand technique because you really have to listen to the violin and and balance everything so you can have a sound that really works. So now I'm going to tell you about my a little bit of my history with early music and Brook Island and how I got into it. So my mom is actually a early music expert and so I, I grew up listening to recordings and going to early music concerts and I'm really grateful that uh, for that opportunity and I grew up loving early music quite a lot. And then in college during my undergraduate education I took the, the opportunity to take a music ensemble class every semester. So I learned a lot about the technique and how to play an ensemble with, with period instruments. I also went to some, some summer camps and um, other places where I learned from other teachers about the different parts of Baroque violin. Well, something I came to really love and understand about early music is that you, you have a very intimate connection with the composer because you have a creative liberty that we as modern players don't necessarily have. Because if you think about it, like modern modern playing, we have orchestra, we have chamber music, we have solo playing, and these are all great, but a lot of it is about conforming to the tradition or you know, playing in your orchestra part, every everything, you know, uniformly, which is which is really great and modern music is lovely in that way, but Early music allows you a lot more creative liberty um, with ornamentation and, you know, different arrangements of parts and different repeats um, and create, creating different forms from one piece of music. And because of that, I really, really enjoy how we get to, you know, co-create almost with the composer in a more obvious way than, than modern music allows sometimes. And kind of going along with that, early music allows us to really understand a more global connection between different disciplines and different components of music, 
because I, I, I know that, I mean, um, myself included, sometimes we're just like, oh, time to practice and then time to go to academic class, music history and memorize or, you know, write a paper or whatever. But we don't really think about how the historical information surrounding the composer's time really influenced the composer's work and why he wrote certain pieces and what they meant. And it's our job as performers to be able to, you know, communicate some of that and to understand what was really novel for that time that, that's in the piece and, and that really you know makes a difference as far as our interpretation and and how the, the piece is built the, the rhetoric of the piece this is very important in really music because we have to be able to know the context to be able to know what types of ornaments and what types of arrangements that we can create from one piece of music that has nothing you know, no directions like that written on it. We just have to know through our education and experience. So one example of that is the use of the ornamentation. So in the Baroque period, there's a lot of difference between French ornamentation versus Italian ornamentation. So Italians were very virtuosic and use a lot of scales and arpeggios. Um, and you might, you know, you might be familiar with this type of thing from Corelli or Vivaldi and all the different sequences and scales that are so common, especially in the modern editions that have a lot of written out um, ornamentation that would have been put in just orally um, at the time. In contrast, the, the French were showy with their use of rhythm and, and different types of trills. And so, um, for one example, they used a lot of inagal, which was a rhythmic idiom where you would play eighth notes or sixteenth notes, depending on the, the type of the piece, as unequal, as swung, almost like jazz. So if I played four eighth notes, if I swung them, so that's integral, and that's used a lot in the in the French Baroque music of the time. One thing that I, I, I guess I forgot to mention earlier, but I'm sure a lot of you have already noticed, is that Baroque violin is tuned at 415, so um, a whole half step lower than 415. And I'm, I'm sure everybody with perfect pitch has already noticed that and might have been annoyed by it. But the 415 pitch is really important because that are, you know, a very solid in historical performance practice. I believe that it's important to to play at the pitch that was common of the time where when the composer wrote these early pieces. And pitches evol evolved over time where the A that we have now is much, much higher than um, what was used back then. And even standardization of pitch wasn't really a thing until much um, later. And so that's why we, we tuned up. Now, let's see. I'm going to show a little bit of how um, the early notation worked and a little some musical examples. So this this is actually Gregorian chant, but um, it, this is an example of a early print where we have the four parts: the cantus, the soprano, the altus, alto, the tenor, and the bass, and as you can see, there, there, there wasn't any type of score that, that was used back then. It was just only part books, and everybody had their, their own part and often shared the same book. You might also notice that the, the visual representation of the notes, even in this printing, which is, you know, after a lot of standardization happened, the visual stem location as well as the, just the shape is, is very different. And there are different, you know, different names for those types of notes too. But um, we won't get into that because that takes a little longer than we have. Now this is a this is a manuscript, an early ma manuscript by Bieber, the Passacaglia by Bieber for solo violin. I mean, this is an example of early notation because the the printing was a, a bit more standardized back then. But so the manuscript really provides a window into the thoughts of the composer and and you know the different flourishes that they were thinking of. And so I want to play a little bit of this for you. And the Ibis Passacaglia was one of the earliest 
a virtuosic solo violin pieces that demonstrated the the range of virtuosic effects that the violin was able to to have by itself and not in an ensemble um, and this was very important for inspiration for the Bach solo sonatas which I'm sure all of you have heard of which came a bit later and then you know as well as the Isai sonata to violin that came much later after that so this is very important I'm going to play a little bit so think about what tools I might be using that are that are different from modern violin. <laughs> a little bit a little bit more but I'm going to um, bring it back to so you can see me actually play <laughs> okay <laughs> something more like and I, I know that your modern teachers I'm sure have different different views on you know, the use of, of performance practice in your modern playing. But for, for people who are playing just the Baroque violin in, in the early music context, um, we don't use vibrato almost at all. Um, vibrato originally is an ornament that was used sparingly and only in certain occasions. And, and because of this, we don't, we don't use it in the way that modern players do. We very, very rarely use it because like I said, the, the, really the art of the Baroque violin is, is the bow and then sometimes the ornaments like the trills and, and the added scales. Okay, so now I'm going to show you another example. This is a French piece by Leclerc, a violin sonata. And here we have the basso continuo part. At the time, they, the violinist would play with a cellist and a harpsichordist and the cellist would play the, this bass part and the harpsichord would fill out the chords as indicated with these numbers above the bass line and that was how you would play the sonata would have three people always so this is french so it uses inigal let me demonstrate just a little bit as I played that I used in a gall on the 16th and then also these eighth notes um, the 16th notes the grace notes you actually give them about an equal value with the note that's next to it that's just how you translate these these French ornaments and these these are the little plus sign is a mordant symbol so it's like a trail a bit less fluttering okay so I'm running out of time but I'm going just going to play a little bit of the second mode of the sonata for you to give it a, a fast movement um, and and you'll you'll notice that let me show you <laughs> my playing um you'll notice that 
there there's a lot of technique involved as far as shifting and as far as you know the string crossings that you have to compensate for with the, the gut strings so here you go <laughs> to share these videos but please if you have any questions um let me know through you know facebook or, or whatever and i'm happy to help you learn more or answer any questions thank you so much for listening i hope i can meet more people as this online camp goes on